Good morning, everyone. Today we're going to initiate a new study. It'll be relatively short. It's going to be on the three letters of St. John. Uh, we'll use the same commentary that we use for Revelation because it's included in the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible because uh, they're also all written by John, tradition says. So we'll use that. I'll also supplement with, as always, the Navarre Study Bible uh, in, this, in, this, in this edition, which is called the Catholic Epistles, which I'll explain in a moment. But let's begin with a prayer and ask God to anoint our study with his Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, today we pray for wisdom and enthusiasm and, and energy and anticipation as we delve into a, a, a new study here. The letters of St. John, and who had an important message to impart on the young churches of Asia Minor, but it's a message that we really need to appropriate for ourselves in our day as well. So help us to do that, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit and through the intercession of St. John and all those saints that he helped uh, nurture into eternal life in his ministry in Asia Minor and other places. We thank you for his witness. And we rely on his intercession now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. The letters of St. John. I don't know if you've ever looked at them. I mean, they're, you can overlook them easily. They're just a very small section in your Bible. In the New Testament, there's 27 books. And the way it's organized is, you know, you have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they're written, they are organized in the way that tradition says they were, the order that they were written in chronologically. Then Acts is there. It's almost a kind of literature all by itself, also written by Luke. Then you have all the letters of St. Paul, beginning with Romans, the 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and so forth, all the way down. And they're organized largest to smallest. Then they put Hebrews at the end of that. So we're way into the New Testament now. Not because it's the smallest letter of St. Paul, but because people from the earliest times of all questioned whether Paul wrote that or someone else. So I guess in their logic, they figured we'll strategically place it there so that you can either consider it a work of St. Paul or the first of the works of the, that were written by people other than St. Paul. Right? Uh, following Hebrews then are the seven what we call Catholic epistles. All fairly short. The largest, longest is James and it's first. Then we have first and second Peter. And then these letters, first, second, third John. The only thing after that in the Bible is the feisty little one chapter letter of St. Jude and then Revelation. Okay, so we're way at the end of the New Testament in a very small section. First, second, and third John that is ordered not chronologically, but the first letter is the longest, but it's only five chapters. The second letter is only one chapter, and the third letter is only is one chapter, but it's only a few paragraphs. It's not really a letter at all. It's more of a, like a postcard. Uh, so I think we'll uh, I think we will go through them pretty adequately in in just a few weeks. It won't be long. And uh, right now my plan then is to get in maybe do Exodus, which we haven't done in Old Testament book in quite a long time and it's a very interesting book itself. So that's what we're up to right now. Now did John really write these letters? I think it's, the evidence is pretty strong in the tradition going all the way back to the first and second century is that John did write these letters. For one thing the style, the message, uh, the, the grammar, the words are, are very similar to the gospel of John. We have a lot of certainty that he wrote that. He doesn't name himself in the gospel or any of the letters, right? But it's pretty easy to figure out who the author is in the gospel of John. And, and these letters are so similar in their structure and their message that it's pretty obvious just the internal evidence written by the same person. So we're going to go with, with St. John. We're also going to go with uh, the tradition that he wrote them very at the very end of the first century, probably 95 or 96 A.D., if you remember, we decided, or at least I decided, to date Revelation from into the 60s, 62, 63, 64 A.D. So that was really his first work. Then he wrote the gospel, and then these letters would be some of the last work that he did. They're not really structured 
uh, well. I say well. They're structured just the way the Holy Spirit wanted them to, but they're not, re they're not really structured at all. He, it's more of a, just an extemporaneously written letter, very warm and very pastoral, but he doesn't lay out his points in a linear way at all. Uh, he, he writes as we've, we've encountered others doing in more of a, what I call a circular way, where he has a couple of ideas, but instead of talking about one and then moving on to the next, he talks about them repeatedly, just approaching them from a different aspect as he goes through uh, the letter. Um, and we'll, we'll see that. It's, it's not going to be too hard to follow, I think. We're just going to take it as it is. Some themes are very important to John in both the Gospels and in these letters. He, he's the one that refers in the Gospel, as he does in these letters, to Jesus Christ being the Logos, or the Word of God, the Word made flesh. He insists on the Incarnation, and we're going to see that's for good reason. Because one of the reasons he's initiating these letters is to counteract some heresy that is popping up in Asia Minor, in these churches. He's really writing it to the same churches that we read about in Revelation. Remember those seven churches in Revelation of Asia Minor, modern Turkey. He was sort of the bishop or the archbishop of the area. And he's writing these letters uh, to those same churches. But he meant them to be circulated in general. So he doesn't address them in a particular specific manner, because I think he meant it as we do all the Catholic epistles, Catholic meaning universal, they are distributed to all the churches uh, for a message for them. But it was for a specific reason, because in his day, there, were, there was, a, as I said, some heretics that were popping up and, in his mind, contaminating the lives, the hearts, the spirits of these spiritual children of his. And the lies that they were espousing, I think, even though it became known as Gnosticism pretty much by the second century, he doesn't use that term, and they may not have been that organized quite yet. But those same ideas, I think, are alive and around today. And I think if, I think if St. John was writing a letter to us 2,000 years later, I think he would insist on some of the same things. Basically what he's telling them to do, these people, Gnosis, Gnosticism, Gnosis means knowledge. And what these people did, they were very elitist. And they basically said, we've been given a higher knowledge than John and the original apostles. And that we're here to upgrade your thinking of, from the original gospel. That if you want to expand your mind and really get close to God, you need to leave behind the outdated traditions of the gospel, the Christian message, as you first received it. Uh, and we'll get into that and see it more. But so John is writing basically to emphasize the things they were denying. And the incarnation is very important to him. That is that Jesus is God, but he really became a man. The incarnation is true. Because the Gnostics would say, no, for one thing, it, there was no virgin birth. Jesus, we now know, was born the usual way. He was the son of Joseph and Mary. But at his baptism, he received some portion of divinity. When the Holy Spirit came down on him. So he was able to teach and minister according to the power of God. But then that power was lifted from him just before his passion and death. Therefore, the blood he shed and his suffering on the cross had no salvific purpose. We're not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. He's not therefore the Messiah. So these are the heresies that they're teaching. They also taught that they are now such a high spiritual plane. They're closer to God than other people. They love God and God loves them and therefore anything they do in the flesh doesn't touch them. because It doesn't affect them because they're primarily spirit. Therefore there's no real need to struggle against what the old ways would say is flesh. I mean it would say is sin because it doesn't really touch us. John telling you to struggle against things that he calls sin or the commandments is not really necessary. Well, John's going to talk a lot about how important the, 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 your mark as a Christian is, a, is the fact that you struggle against sin. Not that, that you're perfect, but that you struggle against sin, that you recognize it for the evil that it is. And that the greatest of all the commandments that we struggle to comply with is love of God first, but so close to it, almost barely second, is love of others as well. So brotherly love. He'll use the word love 44 times in this little letter. 
just five chapters, 44 times. Big theme that he comes back to over and over and over again. But they're saying it's not necessary. I love God and God loves me and it's not required that I love anybody else except maybe the other Gnostics. The loving those who are not on my plane or are not like me is not a requirement of us at, at all. It's almost like, you know, we're now a bulletproof elite spiritual high plane. We're now defining for ourselves what is good and what is evil. What is worth pursuing and what is not. What is valuable, what is virtuous and what is not. And the old ways as has been taught to you is now we're leaving behind. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> I'm sorry? The Garden of Eden. You're right, very good, because what was the crime of Adam and Eve given in, the, in that literal, literalistic way? What did they do? They, picked, they ate fruit from the tree of good and evil. They said they wanted knowledge. God said, you can do everything else, but the prerogative to name what is good and what is evil belongs to me. That's not for you. But the, the sin of pride, which is the primordial sin from which all other sins come from, says, no, I now have the ability to call what is evil, evil, and what is good, good. Therefore, what is sinful and what is not. I'll leave it up to you as we go along to think, does that, does that message apply in our world today? <laughs> we still have the Ten Commandments, don't we? But, I, but I'll ask you a question. If we did a survey of all people that call themselves Christians, how strong is the imperative to keep the Lord's Day holy, to go to church? How strong is the imperative to not use blasphemous language, blaspheme the Lord? Is that important anymore? Or have we left it behind as sort of being something we don't worry about too much? How important is us to be pure in what we do with our bodies or see with our eyes? You know, what God says is impure, is it now okay in our movies and in our, our reading and in our TV shows and in online viewing and magazines and the rest? Is it now okay? Is what God said is evil still evil or have we sort of become enlightened enough that it's being redefined? in our 21st century? I think, I think the answer is yes. I mean, because we're being told that leaving behind those old things that are just restrictions are making us more free, are enriching our lives, which is what the Gnostics thought. Well, I ask you, are we becoming more free or less? Ensla enslavement to sin is the ultimate enslavement. Freedom from sin is the freedom that, is, that God wants, right? And he's shown us the path. He's told us the path. But are we now tempted to think that that's no longer a useful worldview, a useful way to live our lives, a struggle we don't have to engage in anymore? It's not so necessary. And then the other big message of his, which is brotherly love. You know, we've been reading from 1 John for the last several weeks at Masses. Every day. We're now, we're now into Hebrews, but for a couple of weeks it was 1 John. And every day I'd hear this call to brotherly love coming out of the letter we read. And then I'm hearing that at the same time I'm looking at the news. <laughs> Would you characterize our political climate or our social climate as being just saturated with brotherly love? Or are we now being told that it's virtuous, it is heroic to hate those who don't hold my ideas, to hurt them, to destroy them, at least to nullify them, to make them powerless. Respectful, courteous debate and discourse is a waste of time. I'm supposed to get as much power as I can to shut you down. That's what's at hand in the public square. And maybe even in our personal lives. I think one of the greatest evils of 
social media is that it removes the personal. I mean, you can say and do things because you don't see a face that maybe you wouldn't say and do if you were actually looking at the person or being with that person, right? So we have out there flying around in the airways a lot of stuff that's anything but brotherly love. It's mockery. It's, it's uh, disdain. It's slander. It's passive-aggressive insults. It's, it's just bad, right? So I think John's message is very relevant. And I hope as we go through it, we'll hear his call, which is, if you want to be a Christian, you've got to realize the way you define it is by struggling against what God calls sin and by operating in brotherly love to others, including your enemies. So those are the two measures. Everybody's so quiet. <laughs> I know. It's, it's, a, it's a tough message. But I don't want us to look at this as just Something John wrote, uh, we can look at it historically, as something he wrote to a specific little region of Europe 2,000 years ago. His call is universal, and it's going to be everlasting until the kingdom is perfected. Okay? That's what I think anyway. John's pretty serious about this. He's going he's to call these false teachers antichrists, deceivers, Children of the devil. That's the way he looks at it. He looks at it as, as a struggle. Just as he does in the Gospel of John, he looks at it as the struggle between light and darkness. We're children of the light. Those that follow the deceivers are children of the darkness. Children of death. We're supposed to bring light into a world that has got many dark places and has got a lot of darkness to us and which is trying to lure us into it. And we need to recognize behind it is the diabolical forces of evil. The liar spreading lies and trying to contaminate the hearts and the lives of the children of God, especially, and anyone else from becoming a child of God. So he wants to denounce their errors and then give us again the pathway to light and to life. Okay? They deny Jesus was the Messiah, as I told you, that he was not true God made flesh. He was a teacher but just, just a teacher. That they have now been given higher teaching. And you should listen to me. St. John would have gotten his account at Twitter cut off. <laughs> <laughs> just generally, it said this in the Navarre Study Bible, we can, even though it's not organized, you know, clearly, there's, there's about three parts to his gospel. There's a prologue, just like in the Gospel of John. But then we have three sections. In the first section, he emphasizes, not exclusively, but mostly that bit about God is light, he says. And as children of God, we are to walk in the light. We are to strive to stay in communion with God by recognizing that we are sinners, but we're striving not to sin. Not to say we're not sinners, that what things I do are just my choice of how to live, and I don't need to struggle against it. That's an unnecessary effort, right? If it makes me, it might make me happy, and God wants me to be happy, all right? No, he's saying just, we are to strive against sin, keep the commandments, especially the one of brotherly love. And to not do that is listening to what he calls antichrist. In the second part, he's going to emphasize that as Christians, we are children of God, he'll say. We've said that many times, that the best definition of church is that it is the family of God. So when we are baptized, we don't just become members of the church or citizens of the kingdom of God. The greatest metaphor is that we become children of God. We become part of God's family. Um, it's, it's, it's not perfected yet that we'll attain that full glory at, when we're transfigured at the second coming. But until now, we still... Strive to stay connected to God. And again, it's by struggling against sin, keeping the commandments, and especially the commandment of brotherly love. He says those are the two signs. Then in the third part, he'll emphasize the part that uh, God is love. I told you, 44 times he's going to say love. He's the apostle of love, right? He says God is love. He's displayed that by giving us his own divine son made him a human being specifically so that he had mortality and could die. 
That was his mission. He sent his son to suffer and die for us so that the graces of his sacrifice would pour out into the world. And we, through baptism, the sacrament he would initiate, could become children of God. And that also the grace is then to stay connected to God as children of God, to grow into that which we are baptized as babies to, to be, to grow up into that, that we can achieve that by the grace of God. We can make progress in it. We can overcome Satan and sin. And then when we fail, we also have the graces then to be reconciled. If we call sin, sin, if we repent, he'll say confess our sins, don't lose hope because we have the ability to be forgiven in this new economy of grace, which didn't exist before the new covenant, but it exists only because of the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. No other way, no higher way now has been revealed. He's going to say, it's been given to us, we're to celebrate it, and we're supposed to stay connected to that. And he's also going to say our goal and the way to live in this life is not just virtue, but with agape love, unconditional love, not just feelings, emotional feelings of affection for people that we like. Unconditional love means what? No conditions. My, I don't have a condition on, the, on you that you're nice to me or that you agree with me, or that you only do things that are kind to me, or that I like, right? Unconditional love means loving without conditions. That is humanly impossible. But the grace of God is the power of God given to us so that we can do things that are humanly impossible, that are supernatural and unconditional. Loving the unlovable is definitely supernatural. Do not diminish the work of Jesus Christ. The Gnostics were doing that, remember? I told you. They say he's not the Messiah. You're making way too big a deal of this Jesus Christ thing. He was a, he was a, a teacher. He did his purpose. He put us forward one more lap. But now we're carrying the baton. And the race goes forward. Now listen to us. Because if you accept he was God and his word is final and there's, there's salvation and there's union with God only through him, then you don't have a need for me. <laughs> but he wasn't. Trust me. Trust me, right? The Holy Spirit came down on him as baptism. Even the Gospel of John, which we have, says that. There's no evidence that Jesus was God before that. He doesn't work any miracles or pick any apostles or give any sermons. I mean... Satan doesn't even recognize who he is, it seems, until that Holy Spirit comes down on him again, right? So there's your evidence. That's when the Spirit came down on him. And then, in the, in, the, in the agony of the garden, clearly, he loses his faith. He's not strong anymore. He's sweating blood. That's when the, he knew he was going to suffer and die, something that would never happen to God. Therefore, that divinity was removed from him, and he suffered his humanly end. That's the Gnostic point of view. It's still the point of view of a lot of people in this world. Jesus may be a way to God, maybe, but certainly there's plenty of others. Struggle against sin? Well, if you want to be that silly, go ahead. But don't be so judgmental and intolerant as to call what I do sin and tell me I should struggle against that. Tolerance. Not brotherly love, not... Well, that is brotherly love, perhaps. Tolerating others who don't believe what we believe. The highest virtue. The mark of a Christian, then, is not struggling against sin. It's being tolerant of sin. Of not making a big deal of other people. To, certainly not to criticize their choices. Right? We've got a lot of work to do still, don't we? I think. All right. Jesus Christ is central to his message. It was central to the gospel. And it's really his simplest message that he still is. <laughs> he still is. We haven't matured intellectually beyond the point that we need to hold on to this old-fashioned, outdated, uh, prehistoric, simpleton idea 
that Jesus is God and we're saved through him. All right? Questions about that? What was that you said about Facebook, Missy? I couldn't hear it. Um, I was being rude. I said if St. John were on Facebook, he would have had his account cut off. Uh -huh. They can't Twitter anymore. They can't Twitter. All right. I'm trying to challenge myself on what I said so far here. Why can't you love the things you love and I love the things I love? I am a loving person. I just don't love the same things you love. What would John say about that, you think? Well, I'm the center of the world. Pride again, right? And I have now taken the prerogative of saying, Things that are good and things that are bad. Things that are lovable and things that are not lovable. John would say loving things of this world, and he will say this specifically, is, di can is disorder. Loving them more than you love God. Even good things, if you love them more than you love God, is a disorder, is a sin, because loving the good, if it keeps us from loving the best, is an impediment, not a virtue. Okay? And certainly loving things that are evil, or that God calls evil, it doesn't make it okay. We can love things that are quite bad for us. As I told my daughter one time when she was telling me she loved a certain guy. <laughs> you got more sense than that. We can love things that are not good for us. Okay? Or at least we call it love. And therefore we are called to sometimes make hard choices. Uh, because we can get so, not just used to, but love disordered things we've allowed into our life that it becomes almost like an amputation to get away from it. Speak to any addict. Addicted to anything. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Children of the light are not those who call themselves children of the light but those that do right and practice brotherly love. Those are the themes we'll see in all of these letters. Okay. To prove my point of the similarity with the Gospel of John, I would like to read the prologue in the Gospel of John, the first chapter of the Gospel of John, before we look at the letter. This should sound very familiar. Remember now, too, John's already had his vision that we read about in Revelation. So like the other apostles, he knows Jesus as he was on earth. And he has, he's a witness to the resurrection and the ascension as well. But he also now knows and understands Jesus in the perfected form that he's seen in the, the vision in heaven, remember? And we talked about, didn't we, how that must have changed him and informed him, made him more mystical, made him more supernatural. And that's why his writings are so different, I think, from the other Gospels. He, is, he has been made more spiritual. He's been tuned into. He's looked at Jesus through a lens now that is incredibly different than just his earthly understanding. And he's now writing about Jesus that way, or, or at least influenced by that way. So, the other Gospels begin with maybe the birth of Jesus, or the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. But John begins his this way. Something, something, which has existed since the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have watched, and touched with our own hands. The word of life. This is our theme. That life was made visible. We saw it and are giving our testimony, declaring to you the eternal life, which was present to the Father and has been revealed to us. We are declaring to you what we have seen and heard so that you too may share our life. Our life is shared with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing this to you so that our joy may be complete. We have a share in each other's life and the blood of Jesus, his son, which cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. Remember that. John's going to mention the same words in the first chapter. And, no, and truth has no place in us. But if we acknowledge our sins, he'll say confess our sins in the letter. He is trustworthy and upright so that he will 
forgive our sins and cleanse us from all evil. If we say we have never sinned, Gnostics, we make him a liar and his word has no place in us. I'll stop there. That's the first chapter of John. It does carry on into the second chapter a little bit, but that's enough. So in the, in the first chapter now of the letter of St. John, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Sound familiar? Is there much doubt the same person wrote both of these? The life was made manifest, and we saw it and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing this that our joy may be complete. It's almost the same message, and there's going to be more similarities. Let me read on just a little bit. This is the message which we have. Now remember, he's, he's telling them, I didn't think this up in some Gnostic meeting. You know, I witnessed it. I'm a witness. I saw it. I touched him, it. I heard him. I'm a witness. This is the message you have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. This black and white vision right here in our commentary, this black and white vision of the world, it says, is also shared by the Jewish authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I love that. You know, I love my Dead Sea Scrolls and my Essenes. But it, they talk a lot about being children of light, right? And being illuminated to God's truth and the Messiah that is to come. And I think, I think John and John the Baptist, remember John was a disciple of John the Baptist, I think was very much influenced by these Essenes. John the Baptist may have been one. They make similar contrasts, it says, between spiritual realities in terms of light and death. I go on. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Oh. At the end of Revelation, what did we see? The heavenly Jerusalem come down. And he says there now is no Night or day. It's light all the time. There's no need of the sun. Because Jesus himself is the light. Which keeps the new Jerusalem lit all the time. In him there is light. No darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie. And do not live according to the truth. Same as in the first chapter of John. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves again. And the truth is not in us. Here he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. In the Greek... The word confess is homologeo. And it's, and it's obviously something we do with our lips, not just in the silence of our hearts. And that's the word he chose to use here. He wrote this in Greek. All right? If he confesses, so he's, I, I can't say it's, can knock everything else out of here, but he seems to me to be alluding to the sacrament of reconciliation. Remember, he was one of those Jesus breathed on I think in chapter 20 of John's Gospel. It said, receive the Holy Spirit. Those sins you forgive will be forgiven. Right? Well, how are they going to know what your sins are unless you speak them? Unless you're Padre Pio. <laughs> you come in, Father, I said, I know it, and I know what they are, and I'm going to tell you what the real list is, right? And people wanted to go to him. <laughs> I'd have been scared out of my mind. Uh, yeah, well, right. <laughs> all right. If you confess, all right, my, my, my little children, he, and this is, this is why this is so pastoral and warm, he cares and loves, he's quite annoyed at these deceivers 
but he cares and loves these, these young Christians very much. My little children, I am writing this to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. So here he's saying, Jesus, we go to Jesus because he is the advocate. He is the defense lawyer. In that term, that's the advocate. Uh, not just something speaking up to us, but an advocate would be a legal term. Is that position of he's your defense attorney. Okay? We have him advocating for us. And what more, and not only that, he's not just putting forth the best case of why we are innocent before God. No, what he's saying is that put it on me. Put it on me. He's confessed it. He's called sin, sin. She's asked for forgiveness. She's relying on me to receive that mercy. I'm here to give it to her. That's how he advocates for us. Put it on me. And then we're not just called innocent, but remain guilty. We are made clean. The sin doesn't exist anymore. Okay? But only that way. If we're able to come to the point, to be deceived, that we don't recognize sin as sin, how will we confess it? It's now tolerated. It's now even maybe a good. I'm not going to confess that. It doesn't even pop into my brain anymore that it's sin. The ultimate deception. Really? But it's the, it is the ultimate end point of habitual sin. Where you don't reckon, it doesn't have its bite anymore. We've learned to deal with a guilty conscience, which initially was a blessing, alerting us to danger. But now we've, we've managed to assuage it, nullify it, so we don't even feel that little bite anymore. That's when we're in trouble. Okay? The footnote here says, John recognizes that sin can be a nagging problem, to say the least, in the lives of believers. It, it is not a problem without a solution, however, since Jesus Christ is our advocate and our sin offering, he'll say in a minute, and our moral example, all in chapter 2 to come. Let me read on. Chapter 2. My little children, I am writing this to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the expiation, the payment, the sin offering for our sins, the acceptable sacrifice. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we may be sure that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he says. If we keep his commandments, or at least struggling to keep those commandments... As long as we're struggling, that is a sign that we belong to him. He who says, I know him, but disobeys his commandments, Gnostics, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, keeps his word, in him truly love for God is perfected. By this we may be sure that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. He's making it pretty clear. We've had this discussion before. Surely we are saved by faith. But faith, to John, just like love, is a verb. All right? It's not just something we believe. It's the way we live. So true faith, or walking in union with God, should be, must be manifested in the evidence, the results of how we live our lives. If it's not, then the love we profess to have the faith we perfect to have may be something, but it's not, it's not salvific. salvific. Okay? It's not saving faith. It's something else. It's something lesser. And it's a deception to say that it's more. Do I want to comment at this point? Well, he did that sometimes. Um, other times it was later. The, the question was, wh why did Jesus include his physical healing miracles with oftentimes say your sins are forgiven? Well, 
I think he wanted, I think the forgiveness of sins was the greatest miracle. To get people to believe he had the authority to forgive sins, which belong, a prerogative that belonged to God alone. Right, so those, those that said, I, he can't, what do you mean his sins are forgiven? And he couldn't, they couldn't see the man or the woman's sin was forgiven. So he linked that with a physical miracle or a deliverance that they could see. To at least put in their mind the question, well, he forgave sins, only God could do that, so therefore he must be evil, yet he just worked a miracle, which also only God could do. So I have a problem now I have to work out. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to do. Give them some evidence to help them get closer to the leap of faith that ultimately would accept him as God. All right. So John, John only lists six miracles in his whole gospel. But each time he calls them signs. Signs. They, they were miracles. And, God, and Jesus did care about that person's suffering. But he also intended to work the miracle as a sign of the greater thing that was here. The, the sign of, the, of who he was. And his biggest mission was to bring into the world a way to finally be redeemed. To have the effects of sin removed from our soul. To be made right in the eyes of God. Righteousness, right standing with God. Again, a power that didn't exist since the fall. All right? Yeah, kind of follow up on that question. Why is it that uh, every time you do this miracle of Jesus Christ, you tell them, go and tell no one about it? Did you really did that? Well, he didn't want to be, he, why did he often tell them, tell no one about this, right? And usually they did. Uh, but it was, it was important at a certain, he did that up to a certain point in his ministry. Because he wasn't ready yet to be declared openly as the Messiah because they misunderstood what the Messiah was to be, right? Uh, this week we had, he cleansed the leper. He said, if you, if you want to, you can... You can heal me, right? And Jesus says, I do want to. He healed him, but he touched him as well. He touched him, something that would have been absolutely forbidden by the Mosaic laws because they would, they would assume that he would have become unclean. In that case, the sign is that I didn't become unclean. My righteousness is greater than any righteousness you have. I didn't become unclean. He became clean. And I'll prove it by... by making the boils and the sores all over him go away. And then he says, go and show yourself to the priest. That will be proof enough to them. Because the priest could then declare him clean again, and he could start going back to synagogue, could go back and live with his family and good people again. Because up until then, he was considered cursed. Now, if I touched that leper or a dead person, I would become unclean, but I could be ritually cleansed through certain ceremonial washings and, you know, a period of time. But this man, as long as he had those boils and sores, was considered to still be cursed. He couldn't go through the ceremonial washings to be made ceremonially clean and acceptable again until those were gone. That's why Jesus healed him and said, now go show yourself to the priest. The priest will examine you and decide, you're no longer cursed. Let's get you cleaned up back in synagogue. That will be sign enough for them that I made you clean. Because the curse is gone. The signs, the outward signs are gone, that the inner, inner reality is gone as well. Does that make more sense? Yeah. So there's reasons for those things that he did. But, but in the Gospels, Jesus gets to the point that he says openly, I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. And he's dead within a week. So it was important he didn't give them that piece of evidence that he himself was voicing that because that's all they needed to finally to, to kill him and he wasn't ready yet. He would determine when that was ready. Okay? Any other questions? Yes, we want to tie this to the Gospels. We want to tie all of this to what we know because really what we're doing here is we're trying to return to the basic kerygma, the teaching of the faith. Um, get back to the basics it's important we stay connected it's important we don't reinvent religion it's important we don't reinvent the tradition that has been 
passed on to us. Dumb it down, water it down, relabel things. John would say it's very important. It's critical to stay connected to God. To stay in a state of grace. To, to stay children of the light. Children of God. We have to struggle against these temptations that are all around us still. Just as they were starting to emerge in the early church. Well, they're not starting to emerge. They are the dominant voices in our culture now. Okay. Right. Well, Jesus promised us we would have opposition. He said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. And probably the best way to get hated in this world is to... <laughs> yeah, right. But I, I st and I'll tell you what, even if you don't go around acting holier than thou or speaking it, just trying to live it, you'll still be accused of being self-righteous, trying to be holier than thou. What do you mean? He turned that movie off. What do you mean by getting up and leaving the room when we're telling a dirty joke? What do you mean that by asking me to please don't use the Lord's name in vain in a conversation with you? What right do you have? What do you mean by that, you self-righteous hypocrite? You're a sinner too. And you say, I know. I'm struggling against it though, right? And, and, it, and it's a sin for me to tolerate at least. It's a tough call. It really is. And there, I think there are, there needs to be a willingness to sacrifice certain things sometimes because there might be a price to pay. We just have to decide what price we're willing to pay. That's right. But we have an advocate. We have the grace of God. We have the power to do what we need to do, right? Hopefully, we have some success. But success in our individual lives may not be the transformation of the, the, the national or universal ethic or morality. Or, but we do have the opportunity to influence other people. Primarily by loving them, right? To having a certain joy and a hope that maybe they see everyone else is losing, and as St. Peter says, and when they ask you for the reason for this hope, tell them. Tell them. He, he, that's the way St. Peter says we witness. We live it and then are willing to share it when the time is right and the, the ground is fertile in the hearts and minds of just a few other people. Okay? I think that's the way we change the world in little things and, and in the place that we live. All right. I feel like I threw cold water on you this morning. <laughs> you want to do another, you want to study another book next week? <laughs> no, we'll stick with it. I, I predict three or four weeks. But we'll end there for now. I say in our Father and a Hail Mary, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John the Apostle, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.